Hey, welcome to uh, our first episode, actually, of the Semi-Related Podcast. going to be hosted by Optum. Uh, this is our very first time doing this, but we hope to have many more to come. And as always, want to thank our hosts, Market Scale, here in the lovely uh, studio here in downtown Dallas. Uh, and as our first guest, our very first guest today, I want to welcome Jeff Gron uh, with Turvo. Uh, so we're going to be having a, a conversation today in a multitude of different directions. But let me start off by welcoming Jeff. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, Jeff, for those that may not know you, I think I've seen you around the industry quite a bit, and I'm sure many others have that are tuning in. But uh, you want to give a little background about yourself and how you got in, involved in this lovely industry we play in? Oh, sure. Uh, it, it goes way back. I'm not going to date myself, but I've been doing this over 30 years. And in that time, I spent a lot of time in, at a very large asset provider, very large 3PL and 4PL. Um, and then spent the last 15 years in the SaaS TMS space. And that's kind of been the, uh, the, the apex of my career is, is in that TMS space, specifically with Turbo where I've been for the last three years. Uh, in my current role, I'm the Vice President of uh, Product Management, Leading Innovation and Partnerships. And that's really what brought me here to be with you today. Now, the genesis of your question was how did I get here? And I think it goes way back to my sister saying, hey, you should try this Schneider National job. And, and you go, yeah. yeah, exactly. And I lived in Green Bay, Wisconsin and thought, you know, why not? Let's, How do you uh, not let's see orange trucks in Green no, Bay? No, right? no, I really didn't even know what they did at that point. <laughs> but uh, then, you know, flash forward from, you know, 30 plus years ago to now, yeah. it's really been great to be able to take all that and then bring it to the industry as we see it today. And, you know, moving product from point A to point B, using a driver, using a third party carrier, using your own assets, all that really hasn't changed, but the technology and processes have. And yeah. that's why I'm here today. Yeah, and, and Jeff, we uh, again, we've known each other for a while, but not going to go into detail in my background necessarily, but uh, we have similar paths and that we've had a lot of a lot of exposure from various perspective and vantage points throughout the industry. So similar to yourself, I've got a background in 3PL brokerage, uh, been at the shipper community by way of extension to manage TMSI, which I know you have some background in. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, my passion's kind of in the, this freight tech space that we play in today and SaaS and how does technology kind of enable our industry to kind of operate a little more efficiently um, and, and really leverage the best of, of both man and machine, as I often say, it's not a, a versus. So, you know, with that, Jeff, you've had so much exposure to various uh, perspectives with the industry, like you said. Um, where do you see, you know, what, what are some of the challenges, some, some of the opportunities? I think it's going to be a big part of today. We talk about brokerage versus asset versus, mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of moving parts, right? There's a lot. Yep. So we kind of think about the old days, right? Um, there used to be, at least in my day, and I think we were in a very similar space even years ago, you know, there's this idea of this one-stop shop, single pane of glass, one version of the truth, right? That that singular model within the TMS world specifically, but you could apply that in other areas of the industry. So can you touch a little bit about how you've seen that evolution evolve or devolve? Sure. And what, just curious to hear more your insights there. You know, I think uh, I'm going to focus on two things, and I think those will come up uh, throughout the day today. Is one of them is the capacity and how we got to the capacity. Uh, is it is it private fleet? Is it third-party carrier? Yeah. Uh, is it a... a is it a dedicated solution or a pure brokerage? Sure. Um, and then I think the other one is just the technology. And I think today, uh, you know, if we could, we could start talking about the technology. And as you said, uh, you know, historically, you know, one size fits all. What used to happen and how I've seen it really change is that um, a company would come in and they would buy a suite of products. Yeah. You grab a product and, you know, we know who's out there and say, I'm going to buy all their products. I'm going to yeah. start with one. I'm going to bring it across my landscape uh, and I'm going to, implement maybe for a couple of years. It comes at great cost, it comes at a lot of maintenance dollars, and it, of course it takes a lot of time. But what also happens is when you start doing that, historically, by the time you, you onboarded, you possibly were being outdated and in, in line for another upgrade. So it was already dated technology by the time you went live. So flash forward to now, what really the market's asking for and what SaaS, uh, what SaaS is, software as a service has really done is it's allowed us to scale our technology stack with best of breed solutions. And really that's why, that, that's how uh, we came together as Turbo and Optum and really uh, brought two technologies together that are the best of breed in their own uh, markets and allowed a customer to be able to achieve both of those solution sets without being forced into something that's totally unrelated because we're two point solutions that do very, very, very well in our in our spaces. That's right. And that's really what I see the market has been asking for and demanding. And really that's what uh, we've um, we've seen excel. And, sure. and when, when we're in pursuits here at Turvo, 
uh, one of the things we see is we're, we're displacing a technology that's built on top of another technology stack or that suite. They're like, hey, sure. we're using this stack, but this TMS isn't working. We need something modern, collaborative, and innovative. And, yeah. and that's, that's frankly Turbo. Yeah, it, I, and that's good. Can you, and I, we probably should have maybe got a little bit earlier, but for the audience that may not know Turbo, mm -hmm. and I know many may not know Optum as well, um, but can you give us a little more insight into kind of the Turbo, where you, you just outlined it effectively, but can you give us a little more detail into where Turbo fits into the equation? Sure, yeah. sure. Turbo is a uh, collaborative TMS, so what does that mean? So th there's many off-the-shelf systems that plan, execute, and settle transportation. Uh, transportation management systems or TMSs were built to do that, move product from point A to point B, use the technology to uh, give you visibility, and then ultimately pay the carrier. But what really it doesn't speak to, the TMS acronym, is the visibility and collaboration that's embedded within yeah. Turbo, which really differentiates ourselves. We started in 2014. Um, we have a uh, couple hundred customers, and then really what we've got is a unique uh, set of customers that are multi-billion dollar organizations down to um, customers that are a million dollars in revenue. Sure. So everything in between is in our sweet spot, and it's really allowed those customers to work together, work collaboratively across the supply chain to really generate um, better visibility and collaboration sure. uh, within the transportation management system, within their ecosystem, within uh, all of their supply chain constituents, essentially then sharing that data together. Yeah, and that's awesome. We hear the word collaboration thrown out there a lot. Um, it's a buzzword of sorts, or at least it has been traditionally. So it's uh, it's great to see vendors that actually you know adhere to that messaging and, and and build that into their software because I think we can all agree it is an ecosystem, as you alluded to, and it's no singular partner. Unlike the previous years that we talked about, where the one-stop shop again, and I you know often reflect on my earlier TMS days and Optum being a SaaS-based optimization company, typically plays more on the asset side. So whether it's been in the airline space, the rail, the LTL mining, and now as we penetrate the much broader piece of pie, the full truckload market, uh, I think we're starting to see the, the value of partnerships that fill the voids that we have. So when you talk about like, you know, years ago when we were there, it was like, you know, you was, it was very pretty binary, right? You're either an asset side or you're a broker and there was really no intermingling, right? It was just kind of one or the other. Mm -hmm. So when you kind of think about the, again, now the industry over the last 20, 30 years, where have you seen that change kind of occur where maybe the asset players start to realize the, the barrier of entry into brokerage, as we were discussing at lunch, right? Uh, it, you know, why can't we capitalize and create a revenue stream? And we talked about the barrier of entry uh, into the brokerage arm t traditionally has been not, you know, it's not an insurmountable uh, means to get into brokerage. So just from your perspective, Jeff, how have you seen that kind of that evolution over the last, probably more recently in the last five, seven, 10 years, it's really, that's become a, a big topic of discussion. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm even going to go back 30 years, and I've seen and I've seen it teeter totter back and forth. I yeah. want assets. I don't want assets. I want assets. Yeah. I don't want assets. And there's various reasons and economic drivers that uh, push it one way or the other. But now what we've seen is uh, customer excitement is so important, and the customer has always got to be number one. And with that, uh, captive capacity sometimes come in, comes in handy, which means owning my own assets or having yeah. my own captive fleet. Now, with that also comes the need to manage that. And the cost. And, and yeah. the cost, and the cost. CapEx, and, uh, we all Oh gosh, that, yeah. you know, <laughs> I've, got to, I've got to buy the truck, I've got to put a driver in, I've got to yeah. train the driver, the driver's got to be safe, I've got to insure it, I've got to fuel it. Uh, and then of course, they need this technology and these people yes. uh, to manage that. Right. So, um, what's really come to the forefront now is that technology to streamline that, if, that, that, that process that manages that truck. And again, Optimization, like you mentioned, yeah. is one of those things that is key. Uh, a solution that provides ultimately uh, a streamlined workflow and the ability then to talk to those systems that are outside of uh, the asset. So when we talked about asset or non-asset, what we've seen now is, so I just led up to is going with assets and now having a technology, your technology that's best of breed to be able to provide that. Uh, to that, uh, to, to the company, but then in the, in the case of then getting that and interfacing with the customer with a non-asset capacity allows that then flexibility to go back and forth. That's really where Turbo comes in, using a transportation management system that's capacity agnostic right. to be able to then plan, execute, and settle, provide visibility, and then back to that word collaboration. Um, and you talked about collaboration before, where collaboration was 
uh, kind of a buzzword. Yeah. But now what we see, whether it is a broker, a 3PL, or a shipper, they're all asking for the same thing. You know, all these decisions are made in, in my four walls, but also at my origin location, my destination location, my driver, my carrier, my dispatcher, yeah. all those parties, I want them all in that system. I want them all talking to, to sure. one another. I want them exchanging documents. And that's that collaboration that I speak of. Um, the, you know, hey, we're, we're, we're in a post-COVID environment. Uh, Amazon was there before, Amazon's gonna be there forever. Uh, but, but essentially, Amazon, that Amazon effect has really driven that customer expectation of where's my stuff and I want it now. And that really comes down to the visibility of yeah. asset capacity or non-asset capacity. And that's where we saw um, essentially Optum being able to provide that to Turbo. And then we're gonna tackle the other side with the common carrier. Now, we've got the technology to be able to monitor that back and forth and, and then send it to your, uh, your application and, and bring that, that, those results back in and allow our customer and your customer one single pane of glass back to what we were striving for years ago yeah. to really use two best of breed solutions and work in harmony together. Yeah, and, and I think, again, that, uh, today actually, right, I think we announced uh, officially the partnership between Optum and Turbo. And we did. I get excited, Jeff, because I look at Optum as, was primarily built to service more asset focused mm -hmm. uh, aspects of the business, right? So again, we'll talk, we're talking about trucking today. So we everything we do in our application is primarily intended for exactly what you outlined. Like how do we make, the, how do we best maximize utilization? How do we get revenue per asset, profitability, right? Mm -hmm. Driver recruiting, driver retention. Um, the dispatch optimization. We know, again, you'll, you'll hear me often say I'm a broken record at this point. Again, Optum is an optimization company that plays in the, the multimodal space, but our philosophy is really, you know, you hear these tech companies that we're going to automate everything and you're out of a job, I'm out of a job. But we see our approach has really been more about that balance and harmonization of the best that humans can do and the best that the machines can do, right? So when we look at our partnership, right, we're not on the brokerage side. Mm -hmm. And that's been a gap. And again, every company has to ask themselves, do you build it in-house? Do you buy it off the shelf or do you partner? And I think this, our partnership, that again, officially announced today, has certainly been a, a great, it's paving the way, I think, for how a lot of organizations are looking to say, again, you mentioned best of breed, um, the best of how do we manage our assets and our brokerage? So we talk to these big fleets, one of the questions we hear and it's probably the inverse of what you hear when you talk to the brokerage community, the non-asset side or logistics side. Uh, how do we, is there, are there systems in place that we can maximize both? And again, for us, I think it's going to allow us that, the, 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 the depth of integrations that currently exist with you and us, right? That'll help shave off a lot of time. Um, and it also allows us to fulfill those requests and the needs from our customer bases that we mutually share that say, hey, can you solve for the entire puzzle, right? And I think that's where this partnership's really going to, really going to stand out when you look at the broader marketplace. And uh, yeah, we're really excited to, to really see what this next uh, next endeavor looks like with, with Turbo and Optum. So Jeff, what are some of the, uh, you know, we talk about um, some of the challenges that we're facing, right? Um, <laughs> again, we our stance has been, you know, as, a t as a, effectively, we're an optimization company, but you know, we have a TMS that we, we built many years ago. Um, arguably not the right time to go to the market with that product because it's such a saturated space. But when you think about the carrier community, I often think it's been neglected um, in terms of just the offerings, right? Everybody's focused on the shippers and I understand why, but we know market dynamics also play a factor. So when we talk about challenges of introducing this new technology, whether you're on the asset side or the brokerage side, what are, in your day to day, what are some of the questions that you receive? What are some of the challenges that your prospects and buyers are facing when, when you're thinking about this this massive endeavor of how do we migrate or get off a legacy TMS that's not fulfilling our needs, right? Um, we look at a TMS that can be handled, like we still have an asset or brokerage arm, maybe it's one or the other, maybe both. Um, but what are, what are you hearing in the field of, yeah, we'd really like to do that, but we won't get off legacy TMS XYZ, uh, which we know can be uh, further complicates integrations and deployments and effectively it's, it's the data layer we all require, right? So how can this partnership, uh, two-fold question, right? What are the challenges you're seeing and how do you f envision this partnership being able to kind of alleviate or eliminate some of those traditional challenges with working with legacy TMS that don't fill those gaps, right? And then they're, they're, they come out to vendors like us to, to complement them. But if we can solidify that as a singular kind of entity, I feel like there's something powerful there. So yeah, challenges and what are you hearing from the field? So uh, you bring up a really good point. And in the last three years, I'm just going to go back three years now, so I'll, I'll look at my turbo time here. Uh, when, I, w when I look at what customers have been asking for, is they're still seeking that one throat to choke. Yeah. They are looking for one system that does everything. And that, typically, that, that just doesn't really exist. 
Yeah. So what the market has really done is it really, and, and as we listen to it, they are they want to listen to what's the best, what's best in breed, and with that best in breed, um, that really does again point to our two companies. But then using uh, Turvo as that integration hub, and that's actually one of the products that we have that's embedded within Turvo, it allows us to then buckle up yeah. and integrate to the best of breed partners. Again, this sure. is where Optum comes in. So. So what are we seeing? We're seeing the, the need for that point solution. Yeah. We're seeing the need to integrate. We're seeing the need to uh, then have one throat to choke. As that shared customer that we, um, we onboarded, we're in the process of onboarding uh, currently, is um, you know, they just wanted, they wanted one agreement, they wanted one uh, stack that they sign into, and, but then as it flips from asset to non-asset, they understand that there's going to be a couple different buttons to push, sure, and then be able to execute on those. Uh, what what that's really then precipitated then was that uh, the further education of the marketplace yeah. that there is not the need to go with just let me buy that suite that you can go best of breed and those best of breeds can integrate together, and that's yeah. really where our partnership has come from. Kind of touching on the, what are you hearing in terms of what's, there's always an innate fear, right? As, as, mm -hmm. as operators, at least in my former years, sitting there at the table, whether it's through booking freight as a broker or working at the shipper as an extension through the TMS division that I worked for at the time, you know, there's always a, a level of fear. And there, again, inversely, there's this, this comfort zone that's just mm -hmm. natural, it's human nature, right? So when you think about making that big leap of faith and saying, hey, we've been on a legacy system, uh, we haven't seen anything in the market that's really convinced us uh, to really make that move. Uh, that's often what I hear is like, is there anything sure. materially better? And I've worked some cool companies like you, Jeff, right? But you go back to the 20, 25 years ago that, that you're right, this, the, the, the keeping it simple is preferred. But in my day, right, we'd have the, I mentioned it at lunch, right? The IT steering committee would, yeah, we offered optimization, right? What does that mean, right? Do you know how hard that problem is to solve? And it's always way down on the prioritization list, but yet we still act, act like we add that as a, an offering. So when you think about like what Turbo's doing, you're also probably facing the same challenges that that innate fear. What if it doesn't work? What are some of the like I said? You know, maybe it's not the challenge. Maybe it's it's the other side of the coin. How are you able to kind of convince the customer base and those that you engage with that hey, this I, I understand the fear that exists, but how, what do you feel like is really that uh, the way you're presenting this solution that really gets them to have the light bulb moment or that epiphany that says we're seeing this being successful. I mean, is there any success stories or what, again, I'm, I'm asking you a lot of loaded questions, right? Oh, yes. What are their fears and how do you overcome those fears by maybe using some in, some anecdotal uh, stories of success that you've seen to date? So that the, the kind of the root question is, what are we seeing and what are we steering them away from that? That's that yeah. fear. Right. So that fear And is, building is, trust, right? They kind of go hand in hand, yeah. right? So in some cases we've seen uh, prospects now customers that were on the same application for 20 years. And in some cases, those uh, they've been sitting on that same technology. That technology is running on a server in that corner. <laughs> they see the green lights. They feel the heat. They see the little blink, uh, and they, that makes them feel good. Yeah. Now, what that also does that exposes them to risk. Yes. Um, what you know? What happens uh, if if I get a virus? I mean, we we something that we don't talk about much now, but it happens. Um, there's a couple uh, mainstream uh, news stories where uh, one of our uh, common partners uh, had was susceptible in multi-million dollar ransomware. Yeah, and these breaches, cybersecurity, yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, they paid it. Yeah. Uh, then we, we landed a customer that said, you know what, we're on a, that old system, we didn't need it. They migrated to Turbo, we got them up in a couple of weeks, and it was a little bit of a duress uh, delivery process, but they needed help. So, and these are multi these are multi billion dollar organizations that are being attacked that way. So that fear, that change that needs to happen is something that's just it's it's, in, it's a validation because they're hearing it, but they don't know if it really exists for them. They do feel comfortable with the with the application running on a box that they control, but they also look at it and then once they start seeing uh, what a new best of breed SaaS application is. It's really an, it's kind of an easy process after that to get them to consider something different. I was once told that nobody buys a TMS for its UI. I'm going to call you know I'm going to call <laughs> BS on that. I don't know if I can say that, but okay, fine by uh, me. All yeah. right, so uh, I'm going to call that that they are. Yeah. And you want to talk about a success story? One of our largest customers uh, hires uh, their supply chain professionals out of college. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them, not all of them. And they use Turbo and that UI as a attractor to their organization. This is what we use to manage our manage our um, our 
transit. This is what we we, network, we manage yeah. our network. They, yeah. they manage, and they're doing inbound and outbound to the ports all over the U.S. So very complex, very uh, fluid business. A uh, lot of short haul, uh, a lot of pickup, uh, just to a dray yard. So there's a lot of transactions, and they're in the system all day. And they use Turbo for that attractor again. Now, what that also does is that gives them a the ability to quickly and easily consume data just by looking at it. You know, the last time you, you were showing me your phone at lunch, you know, you go into the AT&T office and uh, what do they do? They give you a phone, do they give you an owner's manual? No, because you just are expected to pick it up and learn how to use it. Yeah. That's how we design the UI and your UI is very similar, where it is very intuitive. And yes. that's the great thing about uh, our two solutions, so let's, let's just uh, call ours what they are. They're, yeah. they're, they have great UIs. And when we're looking at what we're doing in the marketplace with prospects, it's we're educating them what you're getting from this access looking, access, not Excel, but even kind of even a more cryptic version uh, of a look and feel. Things that look just very list screen, very, uh, you know, just, you know, very 1.0. Yeah. And we're way beyond that with uh, what our applications are doing today, uh, both in a feature and of course on the UI. Yeah, and I would think Optum, I, I agree. I think that there, there's different schools of thoughts on a UI is a UI is a UI, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I'm with you. It's like there's workflows that people manage. People look at data differently, like to slice and dice it differently. I think when Optum was building uh, the, the, our load ops and load AI products, uh, we've definitely had that persona of a dispatcher. And we have this Gantt chart in our, uh, I call it the continuum, mm -hmm. um, because I think transportation never stops. So having that mindset for a dispatcher that's able to kind of see the current workload they have, but also being able to see out in the future in real time and understanding where those gaps are, what trucks are in need of a load, we're tracking mileage, which drivers didn't hit the, the mileage that they're expecting, which ultimately equates into their paycheck. Uh, we get a lot of good feedback from the dispatch community going, it's nice to see, it's refreshing to see someone that clearly has sat in the seat before and understands the vantage point we have. And I think a lot of that, even to this day, it's never stopping. We want to go out and surface as many trends as we see within a multitude of different uh, customer profiles and dispatchers. And you know, at the end of the day, there's still KPIs and OKRs, et cetera, metrics. They're all aiming for fairly the same thing, right? I mean, that's just business. But I think you're right. You make a really good point. It's that the ease of usage of the of the system in place. Um, and again, it's a trust building exercise. So for optimization players like us, we're effectively saying, hey, at least mathematically, and like I'll go back earlier, we're not here to replace anyone. We're here to just you know help them excel in doing those human to human interactions. And I think when you mentioned the collaborative nature of Turbo's platform, there's something to be said about that too. It's a it's a, a great user experience, and I, I would dare say it probably allows them to see their network differently. It allows them to, in conjunction with other vendors like Optum, to really get that maximum value uh, in a system that, like you said, is not the the old green screen. Uh, I won't, no names need to be mentioned, nope. but uh, yeah, but you get my point, right? Yes. So, um, yeah, I think that's where I, you know that's what excites me most about this being able to kind of co-brand and co-sell with Turbo is I get to go in there and when they ask the question, hey, well, what about our brokerage and our asset light division? Can you service that? And it's like, hey, have you met Jeff? Right. Um, so I think that that's what excites me most about this partnership is the ability to how complementary we are to each other, and we're both, you know, SaaS cloud-based platforms where our piping is very, where we think a lot of the same lines. And you know, that's something we haven't really talked about much today, Jeff, I'd love to hear your take is, this industry often I hear they have a, you know, there's a, there's a data issue, right? Um, we're often at the mercy of data, right? The garbage in, garbage out mentality. So I look at Turbo as being a means for us because optimization is going to require a pretty, pretty high level of data integrity, right? Um, and we look at you guys as kind of being, you know, as a partner, a way and a means to kind of help us, like you said, that integration layer, help us really alleviate some of that, uh, the painstaking process for us. And, you know, when we have this TMS, which is not, it doesn't have to be sold as a combo meal, but we have made an investment in that. And we're seeing a, a, a big trend of our own customer base that says, you know, we've, we've always struggled in the deployment phase, right? Everybody's high five and contracts are done. Everyone's excited. <laughs> Um, and then it gets down to pass that baton to your deployment and integration implementation teams and it's like, oh no. And a lot of these projects never get off the ground because of that nature. So I think that's something we really want to talk about today is you know, access to data and if you can't access it, is it accurate? This is a problem that's plagued the industry forever and no TMS, no, no software vendor can really fix that at its heart. But I think again, through these partnerships and trying to normalize and some kind of whatever standardization of data and trucking and logistics means, I think there's, you know, that's where we see the biggest gaps a lot of the time. And so I think for us, if we can eliminate through Optum and in partnership with Turbo through the brokerage side, 
all of that will be, like you said, that best in breed. I think that's, again, a common phrase we hear, but I really feel that our organizations are aiming to really accomplish that. So when you talk about data, Jeff, and again, we go back 30 years, whatever data meant at that time, to today, what are, what are some of the, just talking about that, right? So if I'm, I'm looking to go into Turbo and Optum and I see this, this complementary partnership, at some point we're going to need to see something, right? The data is going to tell the story. Right. Where do you guys see the, the opportunity there and how has Turbo kind of been able to kind of um, fill some of the gaps that, uh, again, have plagued the industry in my experience? This is a great, great one and I'm going to tell a story. <laughs> uh, Love so stories, yeah. To one of my first uh, days at uh, Schneider National. Mm -hmm. um, somebody was going to lunch that was training me. They sat me down at a desk, you know, this is 30 some years ago, and they said, if that light blinks, pick that phone up and put it in those two suction cups. <laughs> so that was an, a, a phone that was going into an old modem. Yeah. And, uh, and I asked what that was. They said, well, that's going to be an EDI from KC. And I right. said, all right, I have two questions. What's a KC and what's an EDI? What's EDI? And I didn't know who Kimberly Clark was at that point, and I also <laughs> didn't know what EDI was. Yeah. Now, fast forward to now, EDI is still used today, and you talk about gaps, and, and uh, we, you know, can we process EDI? Sure. But we designed the construct and the data model of Turbo to carry more payload than an EDI transactions, that, which is ultimately unchanged for almost 40 years. Um, be carried within Turbo and then exchanged with uh, partners such as Optum. So what we do is we're an API first organization. Yeah. We're going to try and take that data in through API. If not, we've got a handful of vendors that are best of breed in their world sure. to be able to convert that EDI to an API and webhook and exchange data with us. Uh, now what that does then, it allows us to pass you data seamlessly, uh, data packets, documents and so forth back and forth so that we're able to then be operating in real time with that data model that's going to carry all the bells and whistles of Turbo. Uh, and that's exactly what our customers are looking for. Um, we've got customers that aren't all just truckload point A to point B, it's multi-stop, it's temp controlled, it's got data location, uh, documents contained, and we need to be able to process and, and accept all that, and we can do that from that API and webhook. Now, you asked what's filling the gap. Coincidentally, last week and then into this week, we have two customers going live where their data is now being ingested by screen scraping technology, and I just simplified it. And what that's doing is it's reading emails and it's also reading documents and it's it, using uh, AI and ML and then understanding what that message is yeah. and then it's basically pushing it into our shipment API. Awesome. And it's giving us a systematic order entry where you don't have somebody reading and then transposing it into a simple, uh, here's, here's my order entry screen, and possibly making an error, or just taking non-value added time. It's now being done by a machine. Yeah, and again, that's going right in, in the line of the theme we're talking about is how do we leverage that technology? Because again, we have so many hours in the day. Our, again, as I mentioned earlier, our philosophy is how do we maximize those hours? Uh, how do we allow the users, the end users, and, and the operators to make the most of their time? And I think you nailed it, right? If, we're still relying on legacy uh, infrastructure, then it's really, it's, it's, it's almost preventing any kind of evolution to take place because we're always going to be relying on those legacy systems that are ultimately storing that value data we need. But, so it's encouraging to hear an API sure. first. When, any prediction when API becomes mainstream in trucking? I always ask that question. <laughs> That's going to be a tough one as long as you've got these trucking companies that have essentially been around for, I don't want to say forever, but is, uh, you know, have been around 50 plus years. I mean, tragic what happened to Yellow, but they were around, for, you know, literally forever in the transportation world. You look at the main uh, at top five asset providers, uh, and truckload asset providers, and they've been around now. I would tell you that they're looking at accepting those uh, transactions. They're, they're doing, uh, allowing us to hit them from rating and transit information. But what we also have is we also have the, uh, the, the ability for uh, in our world, brokers and 3PLs to be able to exchange data that way. Their customers, maybe some of them are still on EDI, uh, but maybe uh, you know we're seeing more and more every day come over to the API side. So it, it's kind of happening as we see. Uh, the cost of entry to technology is come way, way down. Yeah. You know, that, and that's been one of the things that has really, really uh, uh, driven, I would say, the explosion of uh, TMS uh, business uh, to, to be able to be had out there. Uh, that cost of entry, you know, it used to be you had to send, um, you know, a boatload of consultants to onboard a TMS or that suite. So, you know, then you're talking a, a year implementation, you're talking millions of dollars, and now you're, uh, you know, if there's one thing that COVID has done, it's allowed us to sell remote, it's allowed customers to buy remote, and we can ultimately deliver remotely. Now, with that, that has brought our delivery costs way down. 
Um, software as a service has allowed that uh, the development of code to be more efficient. So those coming together have been created the perfect storm to a very affordable and scalable solution that, again, keeps that cost of entry. Like I said, we've got our smallest customers that are startup at a million dollars. Yeah. And uh, that's that that was unheard of. Yeah. And again, EDI is something that is, again, you mentioned it's, it's, I think I've heard different versions of where that technology may be, uh, when it was a, the genesis of it, and I've heard anything from the 70s to predates World War II and some initial use cases. So, you know, some of the tech companies I've been at, uh, they, they assume that everybody must be on APIs, because that's, why wouldn't you, right? And I, and I don't disagree, but I think some lessons learned there are like, hey, we're, we're only as good as our trading partners capabilities really at the end of the day. So I'm, I'm with you, I'm optimistic that COVID helped to kind of expedite that conversation and really uh, expose some companies that their stacks were, were really incapable of operating in a remote environment. Um, so I'm, I'm, I get excited to think that that might've been the, the, the launching point for, for companies to invest in APIs. And I'm with you, Jeff, 100%. The, the easier we make it and the, less, you know, the more cost effective to make that leap, I think that that's going to serve the broader industry and that mentality of, the risk that's associated, and let's be honest, EDI gets your hooks in you. Mm -hmm. um, every EDI file might be slightly you know, misinterpreted in terms of what I deem as a certain file, may be uh, you know, a different use for, for another customer as they, they look at EDI. So I think APIs, again, it goes back to how it's going to really clean those pipes, if you will. Uh, and that's, su that's super exciting for me when I, uh, when I think about the future. I just, to, to what I said, I have no idea. I, if I had to guess right now, it's still say less than maybe 10% of the industry is really operating on REST APIs, but I'm hoping that Tur Turvo and Optum can be those case studies in the future that go, sure. hey, this is an example of a company that took an existing profile, a persona, a buyer that had all the, the fears that we all we just talked about, but we actually built the trust by proving that, hey, this is possible and you can do it a lot more cost effectively. And the efficiency gains is just incredible. It's hard to even put a, a price tag on that for what the operation uh, ultimately benefits from. So, um, Jeff, anything else that, uh, that excites you about the industry that uh, you see moving forward through this partnership or just generally speaking? Any bold predictions, any? Well, let's just talk about this year really quick. Um, so what we've really seen is the, you know, COVID did some uh, good things for the supply chain. It grew it, it put supply chain on the map. Yeah. Now, as we sit in 2023, some are asking, are we in a down market? You know, there's definitely some uh, directional inputs that are pointing at, you know, one way or the other, so I won't go into that right now. But what I've seen is many companies have come to us because they're not using this, they're not using this time, there are some companies that are using this time and trying to cut costs at all costs. And there are some that are looking at this as a time to retool and reshape yeah. their reshape their pro people, process, and technology. Sure. They're sending their, their people to be trained. They are looking at processes and they're investing in technology. And that's where we've seen some of our more progressive customers in the pipeline and newly landed customers. Um, and what they're doing is they're, they're looking at, okay, this is the time to make a change because when it comes back, baby boy, is it going to come back? Yeah. And that's plan accordingly, right? Yeah. 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 So I, I think we're going to see more and more of that. Uh, I'd say that, it, that, you know, the, the cautionary companies right now, they, um, they're not going to be ready when things come up. The ones that are, you know, kind of snipping the, snipping the cost right now, if you would, um, when things come, come back, they're not going to be ready for it. Where, we, where I see many of our current customers and customers in the pipeline and, and joint customer that we just uh, landed, uh, that cus those customers are ready for it and they're getting ready for it. So uh, they, they've already gone for that, either that transactional revenue model to say, what can I do? So there used to be a, a uh, revenue target of a million dollars. Or X amount of transactions per day per person. We're seeing that number going up. So the expectation is being higher. How are you going to do that? Well, it's it's things like AI and ML being attached to your workflow process. It's something that's efficient and um, and collaboration or, or collaborative and allowing you to do more with less people, or you know same people more. Um, and that's really that's that next level of technology is is everybody start going to start looking at it. I think you're going to see the migration next year into best of breed solutions, less less sweet like, and getting off of the legacy. I think that's what you're really going to see into next year. I'm excited. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, industry veterans like us have seen the cycles, right? And traditionally, those 18-ish month cycles of the peaks and valleys that exist that we know about. Um, COVID obviously was a you know again change the game considerably. And right. I think we all agree that the boom times of COVID for our industry, which 
who knew? I think that was a byproduct I didn't anticipate uh, on a global pandemic, but oh, wow, did we ever see a historical moment in terms of just a freight frenzy, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of the younger folks have never been through a down market, and I think that's something that until you've experienced both sides, you really can't truly understand just how important market dynamics are. Uh, so I'm, I'm with you 100%. I'm hoping companies take this time in a down market. And again, I think there's a lot of reactionary mentality in our industry, but we talk about wanting to be proactive. And this is a case in point example for companies that are looking to do more with less. That never changes, right? We're always being tasked to do more with less. And I like how you phrase it. It doesn't necessarily mean you're giving out pink slips. It's more of, hey, how do we leverage and maximize those folks that we have on the floor to do what they're just inherently good at doing? And lighting machines, and the, the calculator analogy I often right. use, we still use a calculator, there's a reason for that. But I often say, and you hear me say this all the time, I've never had a good conversation with the chatbot. So the more we can free up the, the, the human element to focus on what machines just aren't good at, and I don't know how long it's gonna be before a chatbot actually gets in a deep level conversation with me. So I tell people, like, I don't think humans are going anywhere from the driver down to the dispatchers, and but we do see these some of these high turnover roles. Uh, you mentioned earlier, like, you know, all the amount of knowledge in Jeff's head to get by, Jeff gets hit by a bus. What, right? The amount of time it takes to the amount of just sheer knowledge in your head that has to be somehow, you know, transmitted into a, a, a rookie of sorts. Like that's that's a lot of time to ramp up. And I think again with technology stacks and whether it's through collaborative TMS platforms like Turbo or the optimization uh, engines that we we put into in production. I think that that speed to value is gonna really just be exponentially faster. Um, so I'm hopeful to your point earlier that those forward thinking companies are really gonna adhere to that and use this down market time to really have a deep conversation at the staff meeting level down at the, you know, the entire, the all hands meetings and really have that strategy in place because you're, you're right, inevitably, who knows when, I don't have the crystal ball, but when you talk about the, the, the when does that market actually start to flip and we know that this industry has a way of recalibrating to, to offset markets, um, I think that's the, the messaging I'm hoping some of the folks tuning in will, you know, plan accordingly. Um, if not, you're going to be left behind. Um, I, you know, I was talking to someone the other day that can't attract talent at more of a legacy TMS, and I'm like, well, you're trying to get the college graduate to come and they, uh, to come work for you, and they say, well, can I get a demo of the product? And we're talking about really old legacy tools, and they're looking at it, and right away you can see it like, well, my phone is way sexier than your B2B platform. So I don't even know how I'm going to be able to, I don't even know what this is, right? And so what you see is this uh, over time, the folks that were initially involved 30, 40 plus years ago are still the only ones in the industry able to support that legacy system. But the new talent that's coming in looking for more technically savvy type organizations that have invested in cloud-based systems, uh, optimization, collaborative platforms, et cetera, that's what the talent wants to go work at, right? So I'm, I, I think that's one dynamic we don't talk about is what happens when the old school kind of phases out in there, who's gonna support these legacy systems, right? At some point you, you assume these people are gonna retire and you know, grateful for what they've been able to do relative to the time. But I think you and I can both agree, again, it goes back to this notion of what are you doing to plan for the next five years, the next seven, 10 years? Are you making the right investments? And as you said, Jeff, as it becomes more cost effective, as APIs become the proliferate, proliferation of APIs, I'd like to think, that's going to make that, that I, th I think that's really going to win over the, uh, the buyer, the customer community, because it just makes sense. There's no reason not to do it, right? And I'll be the first to tell you, technology hasn't always delivered on the promises, right? Uh, whether it's AI, ML, autonomous, right? As a tech vendor for the last 10 years, I assure you that, I, you know, again, we have absolutely had shortcomings, and that's a polite way of saying it. So I think there's this, this, this risk factor that buyers see of, hey, we invested in autonomous trucks that hasn't really gone as like we thought. Um, could be, the, you know, they're, they're still understanding what AI is. And we talk about even AI and ML, these are broad strokes. And I'm, I'm not even sure most people, and I'm no expert myself, but I think a lot of people don't really even understand what that means. So I think the onus falls on vendors like us, and that's a big part of what Optum's doing, I think Turbo, to be that education layer as well, to say, hey, this is, again, it's a mentality, it's not, the notion of this Terminator 2 uh, judgment day outcome and Skynet takes over, I think that's gonna be something that we continue to deal with, right? And that is a threat, I guess. Uh, you know, I think maybe down the road, that may be something we were, you know, in our lifetime, maybe not, but at some point that may become the issue. But like I said, I think this idea of uh, humans somehow leaving the equation, especially in trucking, logistics, like, not real, not real. Yeah, if you look at uh, how we're really trying to streamline uh, process and use yeah. it by, with technology, 
the way I think about it is what you're doing is you're giving that end user the time to focus on what they need to. Yes. You know, which is what? Taking care of their customer. Because if you don't want to right. take care of that customer, there's somebody in line that's gonna gonna take that customer for because yeah. they want to. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So you know, if we can get rid of those repetitive, monotonous tasks and let them know when something is going to be late before it's late, when it's at risk, then we're one step ahead and we're also exciting our customers. Yeah. So when we're exciting our customers, and they're exciting their customers and vice versa, we all, it's a it's a win win. That's right. So and that's that's again how they're going to prep for the future. Yeah. Is just being ready for that. Yeah. I often look at that, you know, those folks though, again, it goes back to that natural resistance. And I think tech companies see that whether they acknowledge it or not is if I'm sitting there doing a job I've done for the past 20 years, I know on some level that this is kind of the calculator scenario. Why am I still doing keystrokes that add, you know, zero revenue add, zero value add effectively. But when you're kind of trying to win those end users over operationally, that's a tough one, right? I understand that, right? Because it's, but I often say, you know, we, humans, uh, society, we've all been made redundant throughout the beginning of time, we, whether we know it or not, right? And that's, so I'm trying to, you know, vendors like us need to kind of rephrase this and you're not being replaced, it's more about how do we redeploy you to do what you're good at. So I think that's again a theme that we as a, a vendor, both of us, right, we need to really do that because all too often executives get excited. Uh, they see the potential, but then all of a sudden these projects never go anywhere and often the end users were never involved in that commercial discussion at some, you know, as soon as they should have been to validate these things. And honestly, with Optum, we know that we rely on those, that feedback, that continuous loop and that voice of customer as we iterate on our own product. And shame on some tech companies, and I'm guilty of this myself, of making assumptions. It's trucking, how hard can it be? You know, it's A to B, right? And we don't understand the nuance and the tribal knowledge that, you know, we often talk about who is our biggest competitor. It's all the knowledge in, say, Jeff's head that has never been systematically uploaded. So it's up to vendors like us to go, hey, w that, that's invaluable, right? And we need you to help you know, create the next generation of logistics technology. We can't do it without you. So please like, be a part of this journey with us instead of resistant to it, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's just, some, that's just a dynamic that I don't think we think about a lot, no. but it's so true. We see it all the time um, that, you know, what's in our head, what's not allowing us to succeed uh, and move forward. But one of the things that we see is the resistance to, to change. that change. And our biggest competitor is doing nothing. Yeah. Oh, it's a down market, it's too expensive. Uh, it's, I don't have the time, I don't have the resources, I'm afraid of the expertise I might need, I'm afraid of the unknown. Uh, back to those fears. Yeah. Um, those are the things that are, some are, you know, you brought up what's the, what's the biggest competitor. Uh, and that's, that's one of them for us. That's uh, what we see is the, the lack of the, the drive to change. And then, um, you know, to kind of dovetail on that a little bit, is one of the things that can help a successful project is that those people that made the decision and hopefully brought in everybody in a more of a committee down to the end user uh, to make that decision that the success of the project is also owned by that that uh, senior leadership team that made the decision and that they're driving down um, uh, in their organization that this this success is critical to the success of our company and the growth of our company and uh, just the fire and forget model of, hey, we bought this, implement it, and I'm going to come back in six months and make sure you're doing all right. It's, yeah, uh, it's anybody like, using this product? Yeah, it's like- No hands it, go up and they go, oh. It's yeah. like giving a bike a ghost ride down the, yeah. down the hill. It might yeah. go left, it might go right. That's right, that's right. Um, Jeff, when you think about kind of switching gears, the partnership, going back to the Turbo mm -hmm. Optum partnership, what excites you like the most? So what that what excites me um, is last year we earned a, it was transformational in the life of Turbo. We doubled our logo count, which was great. Awesome. And we had over a dozen customers that we left um, asset management on the table, but they needed a they needed a modern, intuitive uh, TMS to manage their uh, transactional brokerage, and we won those. Awesome. Uh, now. What excites me is now we've got a solution for the next time they, or, or to go back to them and, and then go collect the, the other side of that business. So with that partnership is we've now got not only the transactional brokerage, the shipper that is using common carrier or a 3PL that's using a combination of both, but we have now the ability to handle assets. So we didn't have that, we didn't plan for it. It's something that we just didn't, didn't think we needed, but as soon as our, the market told us we got a hold of you. You got a hold of us. We we met here in Dallas, yeah. and um, here we are. Seems, seems yeah. like just yesterday, uh, we were exchanging uh, API specs, and and here we are. Yeah, I look at it in the same vein, Jeff. I I you know again, 
I often find, you know, TMS and uh, optimization, et cetera, like it's, these, these are tough problems. And I, we said earlier in the conversation, it's, you know, if, without a singular focus on where you're good, your core strengths are, and I think that's, goes right into, it ties in very nicely what you said is, we had this, you know, we have a customer base, we have most of the asset players, and they, they have the inverse question, right? Hey, we have all these assets, you guys are awesome at managing a fleet of drivers and tractors and trailers, and there's a ton we can do with that, right? And they have a true vested interest with, we talked about the CapEx involved. Sure. Um, but often we see that the market has evolved, and we talked about this at lunch, right? Where back in the day, you'd have to kind of find a broker, and now you're seeing on the asset side, hey, we have, we have, we actually, depending on the market conditions, we actually, we, we might as well just create a revenue stream on the brokerage arm, the asset, light, logistics, whatever you call it. Um, but the question becomes, well, if, we, if we're interested in Optum's tech stack, we know that you guys are an optimization engine, we, that you have some functionality to service, you know, basic TMS functionality within the asset world, but they're asking us, hey, depending on, again, on the market, we've become, you know, highly profitable on this other side of the fence. Um, so I think that's something that is going to continue to play out uh, amongst the asset community and uh, various sizes and segments of the fleets, but it's going to definitely uh, resonate when you hear of a, a partnership like we have that oh, can sure. service both sides. Because brokerage is not, although we have played in brokerage a lot, we know what it takes and there's a different, um, the objectives you could argue are somewhat similar, but when you're a broker, right, you don't, you, often I see TMS vendors that have a solid background in brokerage and they built a TMS for the brokerage side, great. Um, but when you get into the asset world, and honestly, Jeff, I didn't, I was mostly in the 3PL non-asset world for a long time, but as I got into more of the asset side and going to ATA events and TCA and pri National Private Truck Council, like that's, it's a different world, right? So I think that that's where we often have to r realize, hey, you can't tackle everything. Um, know where you fit in the equation and maximize that. And we talked at lunch, you know, between this, you know, balancing and har uh, hardening of product and then the innovation, it's constantly, you know, it's this calibration of sorts. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, you know, the speed to value, again, it goes back when we had that internal discussion of what are we doing to service the brokerage world? Uh, well, have you, you know, we should talk to Turbo. They seem to be kind of very similar to us in terms of how we think and very complimentary in terms of the service offerings, right? So I am extremely excited to see where this partnership goes. I like to think in time to come, uh, we can be this brand that really just resonates throughout the broader industry of, if you want best in breed again, of the asset world, the brokerage world, and then, oh, by the way, this optimization decision support system. Um, wow, that's that's a trifecta in its own right. So I'm, I'm super excited. Um, Jeff, any other, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, and I appreciate you coming in. Any other parting thoughts or uh, comments before we kind of uh, cut out here? I'd say, the, you know, how I'd love to end this podcast is just, um, <laughs> about the innovation that both of our companies are bringing. You know, uh, again, going back to that best of breed, how we got there, the, the fact that you're focused on optimization solutions and how to optimize that, that asset mm -hmm. and how Turbo is focusing on basically delivering a model to be able to transact that shipment yeah. from point A to point B, select a carrier, pay the carrier, provide visibility and collaborate. We both do those very, very well. Um, that we both strive for also perfecting that. And what is perfection? I don't think we know. And <laughs> the every enemy year, of progress. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, and every year we learn more and more from our current customers yeah. uh, on what it needs, and we're constantly striving for that. And that's really all we do, and that's all that's all Optum does. So I just just that I think we've got two uh, two very powerful business models focusing on you know perfection, and then you know basically improving efficiency. So that's that. That's what I'd leave it with right yeah. now. Yeah, I couldn't say it any better, Jeff. So again, thanks for coming. Uh, appreciate you spending some time with us. Hope to have you back on at some point. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I want to thank again Market Scale for, for hosting us once again, and uh, hope you'll tune in next time for the, uh, the semi-related podcast here hosted by Optum. So thanks everybody for tuning in. Mm -hmm.